Steve. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the reports that enemy planes are approaching. In less than three hours, an H-bomb might fall over Portland. Like myself, I think you're going to be very interested in this story that we're going to tell you. And in this age of missiles and man-made moons, it takes on added significance. There are no actors in this story, but there are a lot of people. The people of the city of Portland, Oregon. And what happened to them, or could happen to them, on a day that we'll call X. This is the land, between the mountains and the sea, between the snow-capped crater of Mount Hood and the Pacific. It's tall timber country. And this is the city, largest dry cargo port on the Pacific coast. And its people are friendly and rugged in the tradition of the Oregon Trail. The population, about 415,000, more or less. More or less about the size of Hiroshima. And this is what happened or could happen, on a certain day called X. The sun came up at 6.31. Joe Fotev was there to observe and chronicle the event. The paper, Joe noted, was a little heavier than usual, but naturally he didn't stop to read the headline. And Mrs. Frank Stufel, Portland housewife, mother of five, was concerned at 8.02. John, it's time to get up. You'll be late for school. Children late and coffee boiling. And with these problems duly appraised, she turned to the woman's page of the Oregonian, thus managing to avoid the front page, which, after all, contained nothing but scare headlines. The time is... The time is 8.27. Wake up, Portland. It's a wonderful day today. Stay tuned to KOIN for the best in music and news. And now... We continue our wake-up show with more transcribed tunes. At 8.36, uh, the population of Portland increased by one. <laughs> Timothy James made his first comment at a local hospital and settled down to life in the 20th century. Like all communities, religion is important. The people, like its church architecture, are forward-thinking. At nine, a special service is being held. And at the busy port, at 9.18, Ray Matthews, a longshoreman, loaded scrap iron bound for Japan. At 9.37, at the central fire station, the men were busy with their morning chores, scrubbing holes, cleaning ladders, and shining the pumper. By 10 that morning, at the Harvey Scott School, the kindergarten class of Elsie McClendon was much involved with the morning's activities. The council will come to order. The clerk will call the roll. Bean, Booty, Bowes, Earl. And the twice-weekly meeting of the city council was much involved, too. A matter of sewer maintenance was one of the problems up for discussion. At police headquarters, the messages at 10.31 so far indicated two cars stolen, a drunken disorderly. An average day in an average American city. Number 126, stolen auto 14, 25 ash, 10 4. 126 cat in a tree, 14 in Ankeny. Except this day, this day is the one called X. Attention all stations, emergency. 
This is an air raid warning and Conrad radio alert. Repeat. This is an air raid warning and Conrad radio alert. Enemy aircraft are over the Aleutians. Stand by for warning time. This is Western. Prepare to copy time information. Time to Seattle, two hours, 30 minutes. Hello. Portland warning point. Air raid warning. Enemy aircraft over Canada and Alaska. Time to Portland, three hours, 15 minutes. Thank you. I'll notify the mayor. At 10.32, Jack Lowe, the city's civil defense director, receives the words. Enemy planes have crossed the pole. Probably they carried H-bombs. Likely one, maybe two, are headed for Portland. The mayor is alerted. Clark, uh... Gentlemen of the council, I've just received information that enemy planes are approaching this area. I've just authorized the sound in the evacuation sink. The council will be in recess and we'll immediately reassemble at the emergency operations center. And so this day called X, which began in such an ordinary way, is no ordinary day. At 10.35, the banshee wail of the siren echoes the warning and the city prepares for survival. cities in the United States are considered critical targets, and Portland is just one of them. And it's so hard to know in advance how any man will react when that day comes. There will be those like Ben Conrad the mechanic who has heard the sirens before in practice, and who will disregard them. And there are those like Tom Cook who can't go. He's one of the power load dispatchers for all electric power in the Northwest. These men are expendable. Others can and do go. Time is 1047. This is a Conrad radio alert. Normal broadcasting will be discontinued for an indefinite period. Civil defense information will be broadcast in most areas at 640 or 1240 on your regular radio receiver. I repeat, this is a Conrad radio alert. Normal broadcasting will be discontinued for an indefinite period. Civil defense information will be broadcast in most areas at 640 or 1240 on your regular radio receiver. When the sirens sound, some cities go underground, take to shelter, particularly if there's little warning. But Portland evacuates according to a well-thought-out plan. The question is at 1045, on the day called X, will it work? Without panic, the city organizes, becomes a mobile the best it can. Civil defense is not apart from normal city functioning. The same utilities involved in caring for a city in peace are those equipped to care for her in an emergency. 
And when the siren sounds, each man knows his responsibility. Public buildings follow a pattern well learned in practice. The idea, to move out of the city, to move fast, but with caution. Like other Portland mothers, Mrs. Stufel moves her family to a pre-arranged location outside the city beyond radiation range with necessary supplies. day of life. Now, at 10.50, in this hour of decision, the seat of local government is moved to a point some six miles out of town. Buried in a hill is a blast-proof, radiation-proof operations center where government can continue to function. Evacuation can be controlled, and if necessary, the city can be reorganized. The Portland plan revolves around the local government with Mayor Terry Shrunk its head. Government must survive if its people are to survive. Civil defense is government operating in an emergency. Morning, Mr. Mayor. The situation looks pretty bad right now. We don't know exactly what's happening, but we do have planes over Alaska and Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the reports that enemy planes are approaching. In less than three hours, an H-bomb might fall over Portland. Mr. Jack Lowe, our Civil Defense Director, will coordinate activities here. Jack, what's the situation? Mr. Mayor, according to our latest reports from CONAD, enemy planes are still headed this way at 450 knots. That will put them just about there on the Alaska-Canadian border. I'd say we still have about two and a half hours if Portland is where they intend to make a drop. What's the condition of uh, the evacuation movement? Well, now? we have uh, very scanty reports now because it's only been 15 minutes, but uh, we can check with the police and with the traffic engineer and see if we get what information we have. I have no information yet as to how it's progressing. By 10.55, the heads of utilities, Red Cross, military liaison, Civil Air Patrol, Weather Bureau, and all city departments are functioning as a civil defense team. While city commissioners and bureau heads remain behind working with their departments at the emergency seat of government, their families are among those evacuating. By 11, the operations officer is receiving reports on the evacuation of the city, and he is the reporter of the day, traffic, time, weather, and in the operations center's broadcast studio, the time is... The time is 11.10. This is an official civil defense broadcast. Enemy aircraft are over Canada and headed this way. Normal broadcasting has been discontinued until after this emergency has passed. You are now tuned to Connell Rad and will receive official information and instruction on this frequency. Keep your radio tuned to this frequency. Remember, there is a traffic plan for the evacuation of the city. All cars in the downtown area must follow the green lights. They will lead you out of the danger area by the quickest route. Do not try to cross the flow of traffic. Follow the green lights. Turn with traffic. Proceed with care. John Carpenter, a sportscaster, becomes the warning voice. The people of Portland know his voice. Trust it. In 1955, Portland held a practice mass evacuation. The heart of the city was cleared in 34 minutes. It's safe to say that practice evacuation will be responsible for saving a great many lives this day. Should the bomb fall, many will be killed. The more that move out of the city, the greater the chances of survival. Pedestrians are helped out of the city. The great dangers are jam-ups and bottlenecks.
whirling over the city, a police helicopter reports traffic movement to the operations center. Copter one to dispatcher. Copter one to dispatcher. Copter one, go ahead. Barber and Slavin traffic moving very slowly, bumper to bumper. Suggest one or two lanes be diverted east on Hamilton. Over. 10-4, 11-31. And at 11.32, at the operations center, Police Chief Hillbrunner receives a suggestion, and with traffic engineer Fred Fowler, he works out a way to divert traffic. Motorcycle policemen are sent to split the load onto a side road. There's no way of knowing if Portland actually is an enemy target. But with three hours of warning, and the time fading fast, it's vital that all roads lead to safety, that all roads be kept open, allowing people to evacuate from the potential target area. Meantime, county and state police halt and divert incoming traffic away from the target area. Should a bomb fall, fire and utility equipment must be available to move back into the city to restore services. And so trucks of all sizes and of all varieties speed to points outside the city by a detailed plan. By 11.45, the men and equipment have arrived at the dispersal areas away from the target. Auxiliary police and auxiliary firemen are also in action. This is serious business, man. We anticipate attack. Secure your vehicles as best you can. Turn off the ignition. Put on the tarps on the fire apparatus. Take the radiation instruments with you. Move immediately to dispersal area. Move as quickly as you can to dispersal cover. I say again, move to dispersal cover. Around the dispersal area, in local public buildings, emergency kitchens are in operation. Rumors are everywhere. Facts are hard to find. But back underground, at the operation center, with time running out, only facts are considered. According to information we have just received from Western Air Defense Command, the situation remains the same. Enemy aircraft are still approaching in this direction. If they continue on this same course, we can expect an attack in this area any time after 2147 Greenwich time. That is 1.47 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And now I would like a brief situation report from all departments on how we stand. First, John, what is the fallout situation? Well, Jack, according to our latest weather information, the winds will continue in a northeasterly direction at about 10 knots. Let's face facts, gentlemen. If we have a blast on target, downtown Portland, it will be hours and probably days before we can get back in. Engineering, Gordon Burt. We have reports that 80% of the city-owned and public utility equipment have been successfully evacuated from the city. However, there is one group of electric company trucks caught on the west side. We're working now on a plan to get them out. Fire Department, uh, Chief Simpson. The Fire Department's uh, initial dispersal plan is in effect. Several units have already moved out to their respective dispersal points. Engine 24 and Engine 30 are currently fighting a residential fire, and they will stay on the job until this fire has been controlled. Police, Chief Hillbrunner. As for police activities, the city is about 65% evacuated. Traffic appears to be moving at about 15 miles an hour outbound. The state and county police have set up an effective roadblock diverting inbound traffic, thus enabling us to use all lanes for outbound traffic. Emergency medical, Dr. Metter. City hospitals are continuing to evacuate. Emergency 
Hospital units are functioning in Forest Grove and Mount Angels. Others should be heard from soon. You might be interested in knowing that en route, one boy and twins were born. Gus Lang, welfare. As the reports continue, it is obvious that the Portland plan is working smoothly. Only seven years earlier, Portland had no civil defense. It was then that the idea that civil defense was not to be separated from normal government evolved. And in 1952, a one mill tax levy to finance the plan was put on the ballot by a unanimous decision of the city council. After civil defense leaders went out and campaigned, the people voted to tax themselves to protect themselves. And later, the city charter was amended to assure continuity of government. So that in an emergency like this, should the executive branch become casualties, they would automatically be replaced by a legally established line of succession of other experienced city officials. The people, as now and after the emergency, are assured of continuity of their government. Schools report complete evacuation. There's no panic among the children. They've rehearsed this before. Reports from industries indicate approximately 90% evacuation. I think we're doing quite well. And so, at 1.25, with some 22 minutes till zero hour, Portland seems to be doing quite well. Should a bomb fall now, city officials and city services will be able to carry on. And meantime, vital messages are passed on to maintain contact with state and county headquarters. Okay. W7 V uh, W7SAA from W7BS. Follows Upstairs in this unique underground operations center, an emergency telephone system is functioning as the details of evacuation are reported and relayed. Part of the civil defense levy went to a comprehensive microfilming project supervised by Will Gibson, city auditor. More than three million documents and records that go back to the first handwritten city council minutes in 1851 have been microfilmed. Duplicates of laws and the engineering records without which the city cannot function are here. And so, in time of disaster, records are preserved. And now, with a moment to breathe, some can take time for coffee in a built-in cafeteria. It's time to talk of families which have been evacuated. It's time to be alone and think of the future. And there's even time for those who need it now to rest. 300 can live here for a week, eat, sleep and breathe. The operation center has its own water supply, its own electric power, even its own purified air. At 1.30, on this day called X, the air outside is strange and silent. Almost all its people have gone. And at 1.32, as directed by the mayor, the siren sounds once more. Take cover. The evacuation is stopped and there is nothing to do but wait. Back in the operations center, the day called X reaches its climax. Time now, 1.47. Enemy bombers are probably overhead. happened after that moment, we leave you to contemplate. But one thing is certain, Portland has a plan for the survival of its people and the continuity of its government. 
You know, actually, the survival of this entire nation depends upon the ability of federal, state, and local governments to carry out their responsibilities in the event of a massive nuclear attack. Each new scientific development in the weapons of war presents a new challenge. And the people of Portland, through, through working together, they're ready. If there really were a day called X. How about you? <laughs>